Okay, thanks a lot, Sergey. Thanks a lot, everybody, for coming to this last lecture, uh, for staying with me throughout this course. Um, okay, so as I uh, said yesterday, I will continue talking about linear programming a little bit. Uh, I will talk about some uh, related problems. I will show some applications of linear programming to minimizing of energy integrals, and so not just the script, as the script and this and some effects that are related to this, uh, in particular discrete minimizing measures. And then I will talk a little bit about almost the uh, almost orthogonal methods. Okay, so this is the plan. So just to remind uh, remind you, this is uh, our setting. So we consider discrete energies of this type. Okay, and I will usually, although not always, normalize them so that they are compatible with the definition of energy integrals okay, for arbitrary probability measures. Okay, uh, and most of the things that we will discuss will be on the sphere, although there will be some cases when uh, this will be in the in the projective space or even in our RD and so on. So, um, but we'll mostly deal with the sphere for now. Uh, and now let me recall the result with which I essentially ended yesterday. Uh, and this was at the very end of the lecture, so it was a little scrambled. So I want to go over it quickly again. So this is the um, universal optimality result of Kohn and Kumar, which is a very nice application of the linear programming method, which says the following, that if you have a, config a configuration on the sphere, which is a 2m minus 1 design and an m distance set, there are m different distances between distinct points, then it's universally optimal in the sense that the discrete energy of this type is minimized by this set among all endpoint configurations, all configurations with the same number of points for all absolutely monotone functions f. Absolutely monotone means that all derivatives are positive, non negative. Um, and here, since we're not, we're excluding the diagonal case, we're excluding i equal to j, uh, the function f does not have to be defined at one, so this could be singular. Okay. This could be a singular function. Okay. And in particular, we saw very, one very nice application of this. The Ries kernels uh, have this property, the Ries kernels with positive power s. And therefore, this also shows that uh, these sharp configurations, they are optimal codes for a given number of points okay, because they minimize Reese energy for every S, so you can take S to infinity. Okay, so let me very briefly go over the proof again because this, uh, this will be relevant in some further uh, facts that we'll discuss. So you take this configuration, uh, you take the function f, and you interpolate it by a polynomial specifically at the points given by the inner products of your set. Okay? And you interpolate the value and the derivative. Okay? And you get a polynomial. So you have two, to the, uh, two, two times m data points. So at each point, you use two pieces of information, the value of the function and its derivative. So you have two m data points, which means you will get a polynomial of degree two m minus one, right? So you get a polynomial of degree two m minus one, and as it turns out, it will be positive definite. That's the meat of the proof, showing that it's positive definite. Well, also, um, it's less than or equal to f and positive definite. And this is the part where you need the fact that uh, the, you need the bounds on the derivatives, you need positivity of the derivatives in, particularly, in particular here, because you will have a remainder formula for the interpolation, kind of like the mean value theorem on the of higher order, uh, which will involve higher order derivatives. And you'll need the derivatives here, and you also need the fact that these actually come from a design. But then once you have this part, things become very simple. You just, this is essentially Uden's bound from yesterday. So you bound this, F is bounded below by H. So you bound it by the energy with H. So now I got rid of the assumption that I not, is not equal to J because H is definitely continuous, but I need to subtract the diagonal terms. Okay, and then uh, H is positive definite. So the energy of H over all measures is minimized by Sigma. So I can just replace this with the energy with respect to sigma, okay? And uh, then, well, it's, uh, it's a design, right? So, um, 
Since it's a design, the energy with respect to sigma, the integral over the sphere is equal to the average over the design C. Okay, so and I can return to the design now. And that's it. So that gives you this, this theorem. And again, the, the meat of the proof is positive definiteness of the interpolating polynomial. It's the so-called Hermit interpolation. So H here stands for Hermit. Okay. We'll see a similar argument a little bit later. Uh, but uh, right now, well, okay, I mentioned this already, recenters, so this applies to recenters. Just, but right now, before I show you uh, another example where a similar argument works, I want to motivate it, and I want to recall something that we did, I believe, on Tuesday, right? So we talked about the frame energy at some point, right? And we proved this inequality. So we proved that if you have any set of points on the sphere, would also be on the complex sphere. So actually what, what matters here is just the Hilbert space, the inner, inner product structure. Um, and you take this energy, the inner product, absolute value of the inner product squared, uh, then it's bounded below by one over D. We proved this inequality, it was pretty straightforward, okay. Well, actually this inequality is a part of a series of, more inequalities known as Welch inequalities. So you, so you can replace this power by power to 2K, okay, and then you'll have an inequality like this. So you have a lower bound for this, these discrete energies of this type. And what I actually want to do is I want to show you a proof of this inequality for arbitrary K, because it involves a very nice trick. Okay, and uh, I, I want to show how that trick works. Okay, so the trick is known as the tensor power trick, and the trick is both cute and powerful, which doesn't happen very often, I think. So, um, this trick has its own uh, wiki page, uh, so the, and, and wiki tricks, there is a page about, uh, uh, about wiki tricks. I don't think this, uh, this particular proof is there, but there are some other similar proofs. Okay, so the... Uh, the trick is the following. So basically it works like pulling yourself out by your own hair. You prove a simpler inequality and then you try to somehow self-improve it, okay? So we'll use the frame energy. We'll use this inequality to self-improve it to this inequality. So here's what you do. You take the uh, k-fold K tensor product of Rd, okay? So basically, well, that amounts to taking the basis, which consists of all combinations of, of K uh, copies of, uh, the, uh, of the elements of the basis of, uh, of Rd. So your dimension now is D to the K. It's like here, the dimension is D to the K. Okay. And then, in this space, the inner product can be defined. Well, you can define it as a regular inner product with uh, dot product with this basis. But for simple pure tensors, it's easy to check that it will be exactly this. Okay. So, in particular, if you take a uh, if you take a fixed vector, so take one of our vectors from our collection and take it's tensor, tensor power with itself, k time, it's k's tensor power. Then the inner product of these two guys will be just the inner product of the i and the j to the power k. Okay? All right, so then if I, if I want to write this sum here, it just equals the sum of the squares of the inner products of these, of this case, tensor powers. Okay. Well, I can now simply apply the frame energy bound. I can say that this is bounded below by one over the dimension, but we need to be just a little bit smart about this because if I applied it directly, I would get one over D to the K. Okay. But we need to see what happens to these vectors. They live not, they, they live in a much more restricted space they live in the so-called symmetric part of the tensor product.
Okay, that means that well, their coefficients do not depend on the order of these indices. They depend just on the uh, just on the set of the indices. If you if you reorder of if you reorder the set of the indices, the coefficients will be the same. Okay. So really, the dimension of the space where these guys live is much smaller, and this dimension is exactly it's the it's the number of different multisets that you can obtain from here. So it's uh, so it's exactly this. And then you get you get the bound immediately because it's the dimension of the space where these vectors live. So you just use uh, you just use the frame energy bound. Okay. But so it's a, it's a very nice trick which works very often. We'll see it at least uh, once more. But really, it, it's very powerful. It works, and uh, there are many applications of this trick in analysis and combinatorics where you, for example, if you need to improve a constant, so sometimes you, you prove something with a constant and then you want to show that that constant is one and you apply the tensor power trick to, to get it with any constant, given constant to the power one over k and so on. So yeah, there are many applications of this. Um, uh, but um, let's look at this inequality again. So, so far, all we did to prove it was essentially use linear algebra. It was linear algebra for the frame energy. It was linear algebra for this for the tensor power trick. It turns out that this inequality is actually sharp, but it's sharp if you do it in the uh, complex setting. Okay. But if you go to the real setting, you can do better than that. You can get a larger lower bound. So in the real setting, well, this is a discrete energy with the uh, kernel t to the power 2k, the discrete energy on the sphere. Okay. And uh, this kernel is positive definite. Absolute values don't matter anymore because we're in the real case. This is a positive definite kernel. You don't even need Gegenbauer polynomials for that. So you need Schur's theorem, which says that the pointwise product of positive definite matrices is positive definite. So that implies that a product of positive definite kernels is positive definite. T is positive definite because it just gives you gram matrices. So any power of T is positive definite. Okay. So this kernel is a positive definite function, okay. which implies that the minimum of energy on the sphere is the energy with respect to the uniform measure sigma. And that could be computed. And this is exactly what's written here. And you can check that these two bounds, they coincide when uh, D equals, uh, sorry, they coincide when K equals one, but uh, when K is greater than one, this bound is bigger. So actually this inequality, I think originally is due to Sibelnikov in the seventies. Right, so you have, so the Welsh, the Welsh inequalities for higher k is only sharp in the complex case, but not in the real case. In the real case, you can do better. And actually the uh, Welsh inequality here, this is also exactly the value, the right-hand side is exactly the value of the energy integral with respect to the uniform measure, but on the complex projective plane or in the complex sphere, if you want. You can, you can interpret it this way. So basically what we have figured out here is that since in both cases, the right-hand side is independent of N, you can now pass from discrete energies to the energy integrals, okay? And basically, well, we know, well, these functions positive definite, we know that the energy integral for any measure, for any probability measure will be bounded below by the energy with respect to sigma, which is given by these quantities. But then the question is, what happens if your power here is not an even integer? If it's an odd integer or if, if it's non-integer? And it turns out that the behavior is absolutely different then. Sigma is no more a minimizer. Those functions are not going to be positive definite. It's, uh, one can check that. And uh, 
it seems from a lot of numerical experiments that minimizers are going to be discrete. Okay? And in particular, in some cases, we can prove that they will be discrete. So this uh, theorem here is uh, due to uh, myself uh, with uh, Alexei Glazirin, Ryan Metzke, uh, Josiah Park, and Alex Vlasuk. And uh, the theorem goes like this. So if I take this kernel, t to the power of p, where p is not necessarily an even integer, okay. And if there exists a tight 2m plus 1 design on the, uh, on the sphere, okay, then uh, this design minimizes the energy, the energy integral over all measures for the whole range of p's between, um, uh, between the two consecutive even integers. And so that's that's what happens in this case. Um, so the minimizers, well, at the endpoints, sigma will also be a minimizer, and there will be a lot of other minimizers also. But in between, all the minimizers will be discrete, provided that such a configuration exists. And of course, we've seen last time that they do not exist very often, but when they exist, this will be a minimizer. And the proof, well, let me just show it in the case of the, so I'll sketch the idea in the case of the ecosahedron, and then I'll show a more, more general theorem with almost full proof, well, modular some facts. So let's think about the ecosahedron, for example, which is a tight five design on S2. Um, it has, uh, three different distances, uh, negative one plus or minus one over square root of five. So M equals, uh, well, okay. Um, I wrote two M plus one here instead of two M minus one. So it's, uh, it's uh, okay. And you also have, I will also need to interpolate at one. So this is one difference with the case of discrete sets with fixed N we cannot avoid looking at the point one. We cannot avoid looking at diagonal terms because you're looking at all measures, even if you look at all discrete sets, but independently of N for, for various Ns, you would, your contribution that comes from the diagonal terms would have been different. So you need to look at the points equal to one. So that's, that's the main difference here. But other than that, well, in this case, you can interpolate by even polynomials because your kernel is even. So you would interpolate by even polynomials. You would interpolate at plus minus one over square root of five and at plus minus one. So you'll, you'll use Hermit interpolation again. Again, you, you, will, you would use two data points here to make sure that it doesn't cross, that H doesn't cross, that it just touches. Okay, and you would use one data point here because here you don't care if it crosses. So you use three, three data points and you're only doing even polynomials. So you would get a polynomial of degree, um, two, oh, degree four, right? You have constant T squared T to the fourth. So. Okay, and I guess a hydrogen is a five design. So, um, so things would work. All right. Um, let me show you a more general statement from which this theorem actually follows. Okay, and here, once again, here positive definiteness is, H is positive definite, and that's the most complicated part. Of course, if you're proving it just for one function, just compute, expand into Gegenbauer polynomials, or in Jacobi polynomials, if you're doing it on the projective plane and you uh, you get the result. But if you're doing it for the whole class of functions, notice that this theorem also encodes some universality. It tells you that for this whole range, you have the same minimizer among all, me all probability measures. All right, so more generally, uh, you could formulate the following theorem that if you have an absolutely monotonic function of degree, M, okay, 
which means that up to the m's derivative, all the derivatives are non-negative. And then you need an extra condition that the m plus first derivative is uh, actually negative or non-positive. Okay. Uh, then um, if you have a tight m design, then this would minimize the energy over all probability measures. Okay. Obviously, just like that, this does not apply to the previous case because in this case, well, this is an even function. It's not monotone, even of order one, right? But once again, this problem, because it's an even function, the correct setting for the problem is the projective space instead of the sphere because you can associate X and minus X are the same point for, for all practical purpose, purposes. This theorem also works on the projective on the real and complex projective planes. We would need to define what tight designs are there. The idea is the same. They are designs for which the linear bound is sharp and for which, um, well, you can equivalently define them as designs with the minimal number of this, uh, distances. Um, and also there is a transference between real projective designs and uh, odd uh, spherical designs. So a real projective design, uh, if, you, if you take the representatives on the sphere and symmetrize gives you an odd, tight, odd uh, spherical design. So tight projective designs transfer to tight real designs, uh, spherical designs. Okay, and then, uh, uh, then one, if we have this theorem pass into the P-frame energy, it's quite simple because when you take the kernel so on S D minus one, you take the kernel T to the P. This would correspond to the kernel one plus T over two to the power uh, P over two in the in the projective space. Okay, and and you can see that this kernel, I don't want to define everything and show this correspondence, but you can just see that this kernel actually has this property that a number of derivatives are positive, and then at some point the next derivative becomes negative. All right, but let me now show you how this theorem is proved. Okay, and you do the same thing, you, you do Hermit interpolation, and then I'll also show the difference between this and the Konkumar universal optimality result. Okay, so you do Hermit interpolation. We do need, as I already explained, to interpolate at one. Okay, and uh, let's see what will be the uh, the degree of the uh, interpolating polynomial. Well, we need to recall something. So a tight design of even order has two m has m distances, and of odd order it has m distances, including minus one. Okay, so here. If, uh, if capital M is even, we would have M distances. That means we would interpolate, we would use two data points in each of those distances, right? And plus one data point here. So two M plus one data points, which would give you a polynomial of degree two M, which is capital M, okay? If the polynomial is of odd degree, Okay. We have m distances, but one of them is negative one, right? And that negative one, we only need to interpolate once because we don't care if it crosses. And then you would you would have well, sorry, it's once, not negative one time. We interpolate once, okay? And uh, you will have one plus two times m minus one, and then plus one because you also need to interpolate here, okay? And that will give you two m data points and the degree is then m minus one, which is capital M. Okay, so, so you get the polynomial exactly of degree M and then it's also positive definite. And again, that's the most important part of the proof. Okay, and then once you have that, you, uh, you just write down this chain of inequalities. This follows because H is less than or equal to F. The second inequality follows because H is positive definite, so sigma is a minimizer. Okay. The set, next inequality follows from the fact that capital Z is an M design. Okay. 
And the last inequality follows from the fact that H coincides with F on this um, on the set of inner products generated by the, by our set C. Sorry, I, uh, that is supposed to be C, not C. Okay, so it follows from the, the last inequality follows from this set here. F and H just match on the inner products generated here. So that's it. That gives you the proof of the theorem. And you see that in this case, for a large class of functions, you have discrete minimizers on this on the sphere or in the projective case. Um, so the, minimizing the energy, it tells you that minimizing the energy does not lead to uniform distribution, even though the energy may look quite nice, but it leads to discrete uh, discrete point sets. Actually, we were quite surprised when we first noticed it. We tried the p frame energy was p equal to three uh, for on this on the sphere S two, and uh, so Alex was who did that. It was during the ISORM program, and we just he threw and don't remember several thousand points on the sphere and minimized that and saw that they all glued together into the vertices of the icosahedron. Then we realized that. Actually, this can be proved and it's not, not even too hard. Okay, so um, this is a part of a more general phenomenon. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, before I move to a more general phenomenon, yeah, I wanted to show you the uh, difference. So if you look at the difference between the tight designs and sharp configurations of Kohn and Kumar, uh, tight designs can actually, you can equivalently define them through this property, the designs of a certain strengths with this distance distribution property. Okay, this, this could be taken as a, this is equivalent to the definition. Okay, you see that the definition is just a tiny bit stronger than the definition of sharp configurations, right? So if you have M distances, here you have m distances and strengths to m minus one. Here you need to have either m distances and strengths one more, or you need to have m distances with the same strengths, but this needs to include minus one. And this precisely reflects in this difference between tight designs and sharp configurations, precisely reflects in the difference of the proof and, and uh, uh, the statements of uh, the universal optimality of Kahn and Kumar and of this theorem. Because when you deal with discrete energies with fixed n, you do not need to interpolate at one. And here you need to use one more data point. You need to use one. Right. Okay. So, uh, so what I was saying before, this is a part of a more general phenomenon. I want to state one more theorem here. So this, uh, this is a theorem by Carillo, Figali, and Patakini from a few years ago, I believe 2017 or something like this. And uh, it also describes a similar uh, effect. Um, so this, the theorem is the following. It deals with attractive repulsive potentials. So here I write the potential in terms of the distance and we're doing things on RD but the potential is uh, it's repulsive at small scales and attractive at large scales so that your, um, your minimizers exist, the energy can be, can be minimized. Um, and what will be the property that will be important for us here is the decay, well, the, the behavior of the potential near zero when R is small. So this here is of course for R small. So we'll assume that it's non-singular and that it behaves as negative R to the alpha for some alpha greater than two. So it's actually rather flat here near zero, right? So that means that the repulsion is very weak. All right, so the result that uh, they proved is the following, that then if you take this energy integral and minimize it over probability measures on RD, minimizers are discrete. Uh, well, uh, I can even just sketch the proof. I will not have time to go over the proof in detail, but I can give, give you some idea about the proof. So the proof goes roughly like this. Assume the minimizers are not discrete. Assume uh, the support of the minimizers has, in, uh, has an accumulation point. Okay. 
take an accumulation point. Okay, then th there is a sequence of points in the support that converges to that accumulation point. Using compactness, you can assume that that sequence converges uh, to the point almost along a given direction. So you can choose a direction so that the directions of these differences also converge. Okay. So now I will not do all the approximation arguments, but to forget it, let's assume that points live on the line. So assume that we have three points on the line. So let's say we have points A, B, and C. Assume that everything lives on the line, so you can make this, uh, as you approach the accumulation points, you can uh, make these different distances R1 and R2 very small. Okay, now we need to remember one fact that we talked about a couple of lectures ago. If mu is a minimizer, then the kernel is conditionally positive definite on the support. In particular, it has to be conditionally positive definite just at these three points. Okay. Um, well, if so, you can just take the measure concentrated on these three points, play around with the weights. And if you play around with the weights and optimize, you can prove the following inequality. Do you have some sort of an analog of the triangle inequality with ours? But let's now recall what the behavior, behavior of WR is when R is small. And this all happens when R is small because we're approaching the accumulation point. Okay, well, I'll just replace it exactly. Of course, there are error terms, but I, I'll replace it exactly by this right-hand side. So you will get R1 plus R2 to the power alpha over two is less than or equal than R. R1 to the alpha over two plus R2 to the alpha over two. Okay. But this fails when alpha is greater than two. Of course, this is not the proof. The proof, uh, the details take take some pages, but uh, you need to carefully do all the approximation arguments. But this is the main idea of the proof. This shows that you cannot have an uh, an accumulation point in the domain. And a result like this can be also generalized. I think Sasha Blasuk did it uh, to, to manifolds. You don't have to be on RD. So this weak repulsion is the important thing here. Notice that this boundary of the weak repulsion where this happens, this does not depend on the dimension. And remember that in the first lecture, we already saw something like this when we talked about Reese energy with negative S on the sphere. Okay, for, uh, for power greater than two, minimizers were discrete, just two opposite poles, okay. Moreover, there is, so this result, as I said, this I think 2017, if you go um, much, much earlier, and apparently uh, these authors did not know about Bjork's results, so Bjork's result is from 1950. So he, sorry, this, uh, this is incorrect. So he did it for arbitrary compact sets on in RD. But his kernel was exactly the distance. So it's a Reese kernel with, with negative S. Okay. So his kernel was exactly that. And he proved that the minimizers are discrete. Moreover, they have the support as, I'm sorry, these should, should be maximizers, not minimizers. This, um, the support is, uh, it has at most D plus one points. So, so this is a, a common effect. And again, notice that uh, this is the same. So this is the same threshold and uh, it does not depend on the dimension. It's quite, quite interesting. In particular, this result applies to the sphere and, and it more or less gives you what we talked about in the sphere for these, for these energies. Okay. So, uh, so basically what I wanted to highlight here is uh, that well, it's, uh, it's a pretty general phenomenon, which is still not very well studied when minimizers are discrete and what happens. Yes, they are discrete if you have really weak repulsion. Actually, if you go back and look at the P-frame energy, 
there the repulsion is exactly in the borderline case, alpha is equal to two. And you see that different things may happen because when P is equal, uh, when P is an even integer, you get minimizers that are uh, both discrete. You, you have discrete minimizers and you have uh, continuous minimizers such as the uniform measure. But if you move P to be, uh, to be not an even integer, you have only discrete minimizers, at least in some cases, and we conjecture that it's always true. Um, so there must be some deeper properties, especially in this borderline case of alpha equal to two, which uh, influence discreteness of minimizers. And I think that's an interesting direction. Okay. And now in the last 10, 15 minutes, I'll switch gears a little bit and I'll talk, well, I'll talk about a different replacement for orthogonality. So frames in a sense were replaced orthogonality when orthogonality by itself was not enough, right? So you took, instead of the set of orthogonal vectors, the orthogonal orthonormal basis, you took something that behaved as an orthonormal basis in the sense that you could still expand things in the same way that the Parseval identity still held. Well, there's another replacement for orthogonality. You can just relax the, uh, the requirement that your vectors are orthogonal by a little bit. And you can say, well, let's allow the vectors to, have inner products not necessarily zero, but maybe just a little bit larger, just a little bit away from zero. Okay. And then it's a natural question how many such vectors you can have. And I want to briefly discuss this problem. This is, uh, this is very well known. So I'll sketch the proof of this inequality. So if you're in D dimensions and you take N unit vectors, which are almost orthogonal up to epsilon, then the number of such vectors is, if epsilon is fixed, then it's exponential in D. So it could be written also as one over epsilon power D squared. I'm um, sorry. Right, so uh, so we will. I will show you how to prove this inequality. I will not carry out all the computations, uh, but I will. I will show you the main idea. Um, and by the way, this can also. This is also a packing problem. So this actually fits the topic of my. So you're trying to pack as many points on the sphere with the property that they are almost orthogonal, that they are far away. But again, the proper setting. If you really wanted it to be a real, uh, an actual packing problem, you would need to do it on the projective space but this gives you more geometrical intuition. Okay, so let's first prove a very, very simple lemma. Okay, and this lemma will be the following. So I assume I wanted almost orthogonal points where the almost orthogonality threshold is one over two square root of D. Then the number of such points is less than twice the dimension. Let's prove this. This is very simple. Um, let's prove by contradiction. Assume that n is greater than twice the dimension. Well, we can assume that it's equal twice the dimension. Just throw out the rest of the points. Let's assume that it's equal to twice the dimension. Okay. Take the uh, gram matrix. It has rank at most d, so it's a 2d by 2d matrix with rank at most d. So the nullity, the dimension of the kernel is at least d. Very similar to the argument that we already had when we talked about frames. Okay. All right, then let's subtract the identity matrix. By this, I will kill the diagonal entries. I will have zeros on the diagonal. Right? And then this matrix, well, I subtracted negative one. So now it has eigenvalue negative one with multiplicity at least D because the kernel of G had dimension at least D, okay? All right. Let's now take this matrix and compute the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Okay. So on one hand, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm squared is the sum of the eigenvalues squared. So it will give you at least D, right? because we have these eigenvalues with uh, eigenvalue negative one for D times. Okay, on the other hand, well, it's just going to be equal to the sum of the inner products squared with i not equal to j, 
right? Because I've removed the diagonal by subtracting the identity. Okay, and so we have how many terms here? Do we, do we have here? We have 2d times 2d minus one terms, but each term is bounded below, above by four, one over four d because of this condition, right? So we get, um, we get d, if you multiply this out, uh, minus one half. And you get a contradiction, right? This is a very simple lemma. Okay. And well, you can again self improve this lemma. You can self improve it to this, to the second lemma that I have here. And by now, if you've been listening carefully to the lecture, you probably know what to do. You need to do the tensor power trick. You just re repeat the tensor power trick that I had there word for word. And you, this is where this parameter comes from. This is the dimension of the symmetric part of the tensor product. So you, you use the tensor power trick again in the very same shape. Okay. Right. And then, okay, well, notice what we had. We now have a sequence of inequalities for n for different case. Well, basically, you now need to take this right-hand side in these inequalities and call that epsilon. Okay. And then you need to optimize in k. So you can take any, any natural number k and choose the bound which works best. I'm not going to do that, so you need to use Sterling type approximation for the uh, binomial coefficients. Okay, but basically what ends up happening is that you want to take k roughly of the order d epsilon squared, and you will get the theorem that we were looking for. You will get this this result then. All right, so it's again, it's a nice application of the tensor power trick. You proved a very simple inequality, then you pulled it up by just taking tensor powers and, uh, and you get a very general sequence of inequalities and then just, just optimize. Okay. And one of the last things that I wanted to say, oh, actually I'm even on, almost on time. It's very nice, okay. This theorem is, well, it's not sharp, but if you removed this log here, we know that such points exist. And there are really many constructions, uh, many ways to prove that there exist roughly this many points, which are epsilon orthogonal, orthogonal up to epsilon in D dimensions. Okay, and uh, you can prove, there are also even uh, non-probabilistic deterministic constructions. There are also many uh, probabilistic constructions. Probably sort of the most general uh, is uh, the one coming from the um, johnson linden strauss lemma. So, and I will just briefly explain it. I will give you, give you an idea. So johnson linden strauss lemma is a very uh, famous statement, which I will state here somewhat imprecisely. But basically, it says the following. I assume you take um, a set of capital N points in some very large dimension. Doesn't matter. Actually, the dimension will, will, not, will not matter, okay? Uh, so you take any, any configuration point in any dimension. Then if you take D roughly of the order, and by this mean, I mean that there is some absolute constant here, and I think something like eight works. Um, so if you take D of the order log N over epsilon squared, then there exists, a function from Rm to Rn, and it can, it can even be taken to be linear, okay? which if you restrict it to your configuration of points is, all, is an almost isometry, isometry up to epsilon. So which I, by this, I mean that it preserves distances up to factors of one plus minus epsilon. Okay? So distorts distances at, at most, at most by one plus epsilon and at least by one minus epsilon. So that, so it's, it's, it's an isometry up to epsilon between points of X. Okay. So that means that no matter what your original 
dimension was you can always so you can always embed those endpoints into a space of this dimension, which is logarithmic in n uh, with uh, with distortion with distortion epsilon. So uh, then you can use this lemma to to prove this statement quite easily because well you just take the dimension m. I, I I don't get it. Uh, why can't you just scale off? Uh, you just embed in the first m coordinates and kill off the other. But then you can distort the distances a lot because imagine you have the points. So, so you you have the points. Um, think about the cube in high dimensions, right? It's not so easy to embed it into low dimensions. Without uh, without preserving with pre while preserving the distances. Uh -huh. So here it's not an isometry. You you distort the distances, of course, but you distort them very little. So and it's interesting that uh, uh, so M is much larger than D, is it? Yeah, M is much larger than D, right? Okay. Yeah, usually M is much larger than D. And what we'll do here is exactly that. We'll take M equal to M. Okay, so and we'll take n orthogonal points. So x will just be an orthonormal basis. Okay, so those points are orthogonal. Now, by the Schaus lemma, you can uh, you can embed it into R d with d around to the order log m over epsilon squared. Okay, so the new points will be orthogonal up to epsilon. I'm being I'm being precise here. Okay. And then, well, what's n? Then n is exactly of the order e to the power constant, uh, constant n d epsilon squared. There are other other ways to, to do this. And as I said, there are even some uh, deterministic constructions as well. Which is good. But I, I think this is a very nice general argument. So I will take just a couple more minutes, I apologize, maybe one or two more. So um, it's interesting that, uh, so so what happens is the following. If you're take, if you want to take n orthogonal, if you want to take orthogonal points in d dimensions, you can of course take it most d. So that's linear in the dimension. Now, if you're willing to give a little bit of error epsilon, some fixed epsilon, and then if the dimension grows, dimension becomes large, then the number of points that you can construct uh, grows exponentially in the dimension. Okay. Uh, so it's an interesting, it's very trivial, but interesting fact that now if, if you want all the points to have inner product strictly less than minus epsilon, so assume, you have take some positive epsilon and you take a set of points in the sphere. Such that the inner product between all of them is less than minus epsilon. So they are more than 90 degree more than pi over two apart more than pi over two by some fixed amount. Okay. Um, well, then the question is, what's the number of these points? Turns out that in this case, the upper bound is independent of D, depends only on epsilon, and it's very, very simple. Um, so you do the following. Let's look at the sum of all these vectors. Squared. This is a non-negative quantity, of course, but also you can square this out and you will have, first you'll have N from the diagonal terms, you'll get N, right? From the non-diagonal terms, you'll get that this is less than n times n minus one. Of, sorry, this is a minus epsilon. Now just solve this for n. You will get that n is uh, less than but it will be one plus one over epsilon, right? So it behaves like one over epsilon, 
independently of D. So for this problem, even if the dimension is very, very large, the largest packing that you can get is in, uh, is independent of the dimension. It's uh, It has cardinality of the order one over epsilon. So I'll finish here. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure given this course. Sorry if I was not always very well organized for this. I hope you learned something. And um, uh, yeah, I covered less than I wanted to, but I think it's probably more important that, that everyone could follow uh, than covering a lot of material. Okay, so thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys.